SpaceX's test launch of its Starship rocket exploded into a fiery crash, or as Elon Musk calls that, pulling a Twitter. Ground control thinks it blew up after three rockets failed to ignite, although since this was Texas, it might have been shot out of the sky after accidentally flying over the lawn of an 85-year-old white man who mistook it for an intruder. More on that later. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. BuzzFeed is closing its BuzzFeed news operation. The announcement was made by BuzzFeed CEO Jonah Peretti in a company memo entitled, 15 of the coolest reasons I can no longer continue to fund BuzzFeed. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Dick Durbin has asked Chief Justice John Roberts to testify before Congress in early May about Clarence Thomas's gifts from billionaire Harlan Crow. But when you think about it, Thomas and Crow are a perfect match. Harlan has absolutely no business before the court, and Clarence has absolutely no business being on the court. Dick Durbin, by the way, is also who Clarence Thomas told Anita Hill was his favorite porn star, Dick Durbin. Different guy, not the senator, the the porn star. In Kansas, a 16-year-old boy knocked on the wrong door, and the 84-year-old man living there shot him in the head. The old man was white, the young boy was black, so obviously we need to have a serious conversation in this country about race. And then in upstate New York, a 20-year-old girl drove up the wrong driveway, and the homeowner fired two shots at the car from his porch and killed her. She was white, and he was white. So maybe in addition to race, we need to have a serious conversation about driving up the wrong driveways. People who make driveways, people who make driveways need to post signs that read, are you sure this is your driveway? We need to have a serious conversation about race and driveways in this country. Then two Texas cheerleaders were shot when they opened the wrong car door in a supermarket parking lot. Okay, so in addition to a serious conversation about race, as well as a serious conversation about driving up the wrong driveways, here in America, we need to have a serious, heartfelt conversation about uh, 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 cheerleaders in supermarket parking lots thinking that's their car, but it isn't. We, we need to speak to the auto companies and figure out a way to make cars more recognizable to their cheerleaders. How many more cheerleaders must be shot because they mistook someone else's car for their own? So we need to have a serious conversation in this country about that. And then in North Carolina, a six-year-old was seriously wounded after her basketball rolled onto a neighbor's front lawn and that neighbor opened fire. So obviously, we need to have a serious conversation in this country about lawns and making them ball resistant. And, you know, there's a lot of blame to spread around here. Balls should also be manufactured to prevent themselves from rolling onto someone else's lawns. And, you know, there are a lot of serious conversations to be had this week. But I think that covers everything, right? Uh, Race, driveways, cars, balls, and lawns. I guess that covers everything. Did I forget anything? No, that's it. I, I think I've covered all the reasons innocent Americans keep getting shot Uh, So uh, we should move on. Let us go now to New York City, where Judah Friedlander is standing by. You know Judah from his work in movies and television. And he is an accomplished stand-up comic, one of the best. One of the best. His Netflix special is... 
I hope I'm getting this right. America is the greatest country in the United States. Is it? Did I get that right? If that's what the words say on the title, then that's <laughs> correct, David. I'm not going to admonish you or praise you for any specific reading skills okay. that you have. Well, please welcome Judah Friedlander. Thank you. Thank you, America. Thank you. Hot crowd here. The, uh, the special that you did for Netflix, you directed that, right? Yes, except I didn't do it for Netflix. I, I made it. And then after it was finished, uh, it got licensed to Netflix. So they technically didn't produce it. I see. And this was right before you made the... See, David, this is a serious point. This is a serious point okay. I'm making. Um, like when you just said that there, your Netflix special, what you're doing is corporate branding. You're taking the corporate's angle, corporation's angle on the branding. It's a stand-up comedy movie performance film. Right. That's what it is. It happens, if people want to watch it, it happens to be on Netflix. Well, I mean, like, I watch... No, but I'm serious. I'm serious. This is like words. Like, words are important. You're a writer. You know that, right? Yeah. So if you're saying something is a Netflix special the first thing you hear before you hear comedy before you hear the performer artist name is you hear the corporation netflix right i see what you're saying it should now if someone did a special and they're a hack and all they do is do a a special for a, a big corporation and that's their only goal fine call it that then but mine was made completely independently from netflix it's a stand-up comedy performance film. Okay. And if people want to see it, the best deal I was able to get was to have it licensed to Netflix. Okay. So it's a stand-up comedy performance film, and it happens to appear on Netflix. So, so I just want to make that. I don't use that words Netflix special or HBO special. It's comedy. It's art first. So it's not Netflix the Godfather that I was watching the other day. Well, maybe you were. Maybe that's a new series they have that I'm not aware of. But now you're a guest on the show and I don't want to be rude to you. Do you mind if I ask you? Do you mind if I, I, I don't want you to leave? The fact that you said you're a guest on the show, I don't want to be rude to you. I don't trust you with that. No, I'm just I saying, think... what, what did Netflix ever do to you that you would be disloyal to Netflix? We're having Mike Elk on the show today, big labor. Well, report. I just made a documentary about how giant corporations um, pay zero dollars in taxes, and I've pitched it so far to Netflix and Amazon, and I haven't heard back yet. So you you made a documentary going after corporations? No, no, I made a doc a documentary that's pro people and equality. But it sounds negative to me. I don't. I corporations. That's exactly what a corporate. Uh, a corporate cheerleader would say, David. I don't know why you would be anti Netflix. They they they're brave. They've reinvented. Well, David, how, if you would listen to your own podcast, I can't be bothered. If you would listen to your own podcast, David, about the mob like tactics that these corporations use in getting these these monthly fees, these subscriptions, like protection services. Netflix is protection service uh, for boredom. That's what it is. People pay 16 bucks, 17 bucks a month so that they can be protected from being bored. I, I just can't have you come on this show and trash a wholesome company. You've changed, David. I haven't changed. changed. I think you're kind of, I mean... I think the Upper East Side has finally gotten to you, David. Uh, Netflix has kept me distracted from climate change, the suffering of the poor. If I didn't have Netflix to watch 24 hours a day, my mind would be fixated on fixing what's wrong with the planet. You shouldn't use the same word twice in one sentence, David. You have monologophobia. No. I'm just saying, as a writer, you shouldn't be doing that, David. Okay. So did you really make a documentary about 
corporations not paying their taxes? David, I don't lie. You know, the fact that you would question my truth um, says a lot about you, David. And, and what corporations did you interview? Because they are people, aren't they? You know, yeah, that's a great point you bring up because people always blame shit on corporations. But people did create and run the corporation. So you do have to blame people also. And a corporation is a person. So when you I've been saying that for years, I, I in 1983, I started National Hug a Corporation Day. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think sometimes when you go after Netflix, that's an ad hominem attack. You're attacking a human being who has feelings. And I also believe you shouldn't make trouble with very powerful people. You know what? You bring up a serious issue, Dave, that I want to talk about. here. Okay. And this is one of the reasons this country is where it's at. And that is, I think, I mean, I might be wrong, but... I think this country might be one of the most conformist countries. I'll go um, along with that. You know, the old saying, you know, don't rock the boat. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, people should be rocking the boat. And so all these behaviors that were actually, you know, good individualistic behaviors, um, you know, since people are kids, they get squashed. And, uh, and then the country has the illusion of individualism. Right. But it's just austerity. Have you ever rocked a boat? I'm a land guy. I leave right. the water to the fish, so I don't invade their turf. Right, but I, I have rocked an actual boat. Okay. I did a prom show on boats. I've done that before. <laughs> did... I've done stand-up comedy shows on prom. So, <laughs> so for people outside New York City who are older than 17, they may not know about this, but... Um, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to, in like the 80s and 90s, they would do it in 2000s. Like prom kids, prom night is basically just a night where kids think they're celebrating themselves and being, you know, like celebrity rock stars. Right. But it's really just adults scamming kids and their parents out of as much money as they can. Photographers. Really yeah, yeah, limos, maker, all yeah. this stuff. Right. So... Many comedy clubs will have comedy shows just for prom kids. And the shows usually start at midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., the earliest. Sometimes the shows might start at 3 or 4 a.m. And uh, so the, the idea is the kids are up all night with activities doing stuff and they can't drink. So one time, uh, so there's also these boat, these prom boat shows where you have to go down um, – to lower Manhattan and you get on a boat at like one in the morning and the kids, you know, there's a DJ, a dance floor on the boat. You know, there might be some shitty snacks and stuff. And then somewhere between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., you do a stand up set on the boat for the high school kids. And most of them have no idea that there's going to be a comedy show that night. And uh, so one time I did this one show. And it was almost an all black high school. And I get down there at, uh, I remember, I remember I'm, I'm getting a cab down there because there's no subways that go, uh, or I wasn't near a subway that goes right near there. And it's like two in the morning is, I have to get there, I think at like one or one thirty, And, you know, getting a subway at that hour, it's just not too reliable. So I got a cab, an undercover cop car crashed into us. Wow. On the way there, it was a very slow, you know, you know, five mile an hour crash or whatever. But I had to get like another cab to get there. So I get there and there's two high schools lined up to two different boats. And there's one really shitty, shitty. It looks like it's going to sink any second. Decrepit boat. Mm -hmm. And there's about. 400 black students lined up to go on that boat. And then a little bit further away is this gigantic state of the art. It's like a billionaire's yacht. And there's about 50 white kids lined up to get that one. And, and I'm just waiting there, you know, and people like, it's obvious, like I don't work for the boat company or the prom promotion company. I'm definitely not a high school student. So people are like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> 
and then I meet one of the kids at, at, at the black high school who I'm doing a show for. And uh, he's the president. And I hear him. He's like the student president. And I hear him going. He looks at the boat, the fancy boat that the rich white kids are. And, and he's like, hey, that's our boat. I reserved that boat four months ago. And then uh, and then so he starts talking to some of the people working there and they're looking at their clipboards going. Uh, uh, and then and then that boat with the rich white kids on it just starts taking off and already docked. <laughs> this is like a movie. And, and the black kids like he's like, hey, that's our boat. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So then instead of like bringing the boat back, they just had 300 black kids get on this tiny fucking boat that looks like it's about to sink. And that was not the fucking boat they did. So I don't know I, if this was why like, didn't they go after that boat and, you know, like pirates. Oh, that would be fucking cool. That would have been awesome. <laughs> it just seize the boat. So I don't know if, you know, it's certainly likely that the people running it were like racist and were like, all right, we're the, the black kids uh, that we're going to give them the shitty boat. Of course. And put the white kids on the fancy boat. Right. Or maybe it was just a coincidence. Probably not. <laughs> but but anyways, uh, so then I I so now I'm on the boat and uh, there's like nowhere to hang out. There's no backstage. They had this one little dance floor on the boat and everyone's dancing, having like the time of their lives. There's like a white guy who's the DJ. <laughs> he keeps yelling at everyone not to dance too much because it's making his record skip. <laughs> and Don't rock. And the then boat. like an hour and a half into this, uh, he just goes, all right, it's he goes, all right, it's comedy time. And then I have to go out there in the middle of the dance floor and just start doing comedy. And I think like the student president was like the only guy who knew I was doing a comedy show. <laughs> no one else knew there was a comedy show about to happen. The show doesn't go well, but it, it could have gone so much worse. Mm -hmm. um, but so, you know, I can't remember if it was like 10 or 20 minutes or whatever, but the kids are just more like exhausted and like confused and like bummed out. Like, why did they have to stop dancing? Cause they're all just having a great time. <laughs> and like I said, there's no backstage I'm not going to hang out the DJ who's just nonstop yelling at the kids while they're dancing to not dance so hard. And then so uh, there, so yeah, I just like hang out in like the basement of the boat where there's like some staff like and and then it's like 430. You get back in the morning and then you're like, all right, how the fuck do I get home now? And, you know, this is pre Uber, pre Lyft, mm -hmm. you, you know, so. Yeah. So anyways, that was uh, hey, now playing, when you did the boat stuff. It just made me remember that story. And playing to high school, that, that is that would be a great scene in a movie. Yeah. You should think yeah. about that. The, the, the yeah. idea of uh, poor kids being ripped off and then yeah. seizing another yeah. boat. Yeah. Playing to. Yeah. The black kids uh, yeah. getting totally scammed. <laughs> right. I don't know if they were poor or not, but they got fucking scammed big time. And, and yeah. the, ca the, the captain of your boat should be a drunk, like, and just yeah. go start yeah. ramming it. Playing yeah. to high school students, I would think you would be told what you can and can't say, even though they're more offensive than you are. They know more offensive, yeah, dirtier you know, things the, than you do. That, that kind of stuff does happen a lot, but I, I'll be honest. I really don't remember hearing any um, notes about what you can or cannot say, but there probably was, but I don't remember any. Um, I, I would assume you can't talk about sex. Mm, I don't know. I, I, I really don't remember. I, I remember doing a, um, this is also, this is like in the nine, this is yeah. Early nineties. I remember doing a show at a Orthodox uh, seafood restaurant in Borough Park, Brooklyn, which is pretty much all Hasidic and Orthodox mm -hmm. and rabbi in the room. And we actually got a printout of all the words you can. And can. <laughs> so, like it actually says, like, don't say schmeckle. Um, <laughs> don't say took us, uh, you know, don't even mention the word sex. And <laughs> yeah, that was just uh, that was a pretty awful night. Let's face it. That was pretty bad. But yeah, I, I saved that sheet. I have it somewhere. I should, I should put up. Did it have a hole in it? In no, no, no. It didn't have that. Yeah. Now is that but true I, I or not? Write. I I had some good stories for them because I I live in a high rise building. I live on the fortieth floor, 
and we only have one elevator, <laughs> and it's a Shabbos elevator. <laughs> Seven days a week. For people who don't know, a Shabbos elevator stops at every floor uh, so that people don't have to technically use electricity and touch the buttons. But they're in an elevator. People who are who are religious. Yeah, theoretically, they just shouldn't be in a fucking elevator. They should not they just, be in an elevator. Right, right. But they, there's all there's a million loopholes. Yeah, you know, yeah. For Friday night to Saturday night. Yeah. 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 The the uh, worst gig you've played uh, in in the corporate. Well, I just told you about two great ones. Yeah. Um, well, they, they actually when they're really horrible, they're great. Well, dude, I remember doing a gig with you. That was uh, not a fun gig. It was at the Improv in L.A. It was some kind of fundraiser, and it was almost all like like right wing Republican voting was, Jewish people, or, right? I, and I remember you telling them at one point, "Shame on you!" <laughs> you said, go ahead. I re- that's when we became friends. This is <laughs> I remember that. What? What? I was. I mean, it's probably twenty years ago in L.A. I, I remember it was two thousand and four. It was okay. a fundraiser uh, for they were it was a Jewish organization. And I found out they were voting for George W. Bush. And oh, it was pretty easy to find out. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. But they but yeah, they were giving you a, you got in like a fight with them, basically. Yeah, it was it was like 300 right wing Jews. Yeah. And I, and I said to them, you're horrible people. You're supporting an illegal war and. I said something to the effect. I just remember you saying to them, shame on you. Yeah. And, and you were they completely were, serious. They were all booing me. It wasn't a joke. Yeah. And I went, shame on all of you. you <laughs> shame on. I remember that. Yeah, that was an impressive show. And I said, I don't care what any of you think of me. It's what I think of you. And you're yeah. all horrific people. And you're yeah. an embarrassment. And I said something to the effect I, I don't I don't know who I brought up, but I said, you don't brag. The Jews don't brag about you like you won't brag to your kids about you and what y- you think you'll brag about. Are you talking about Jewish people in general or what, what are you no, saying? I'm talking about right wing Jews? Oh, OK. I said, okay. when you go back to your shul and you teach your kids about great Jews, you're not being taught you, and your rabbi is not being taught in those schools because nobody, history will not be proud of your okay. rabbi. And the yeah. rabbi was there. He goes, he's here. And I go, I don't give a well, shit. The, there was a rabbi in the room? Yeah, I, I said, I don't that. give a shit. Yeah. He's an idiot. He's a right-wing idiot. How could you say that about a rabbi? I said, let me say it slower for you if, if, if you're that stupid. Wow, I don't even know if I saw that part. Yeah. Wow. To their credit, they I, I, I swear to God, They invited me back the next year. I swear to you. To their credit, they wanted me back. They wanted to to get in more of their yearly (laughs) booing practice. (laughs) No, I mean, they, you know, they they thought they were going to hear a comedian and uh, they got they got to really heckle one. Wow. Yeah, it did get it did get it was the it was the war in Iraq. And that that was going on. I remember. And that to me was the dividing line. Like my son. Uh, has a godfather who I stopped talking to because he supported the war. And I was this guy's son's godfather and he supported the war in Iraq. Mm. And that was the dividing line for me by 2000 and by the, like the summer of 2003, I said, if you're for this war, you're my enemy. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that, that was 20 years ago or 21 years, eh, 20 21 years ago. If it was 2004, that would be 19 years ago. Yeah, I, I promise there wouldn't be any math. Yeah, Do fair you, enough. So bombing, are we dead inside? Are comedians dead inside because... I can't speak for all comics, but what, what's the question? I would say I'm dead inside. That I No, I'm not that way. No I way. left that evening, I called my mother, and she said, good, get them. Get good for you. They're assholes. And I'm like, <laughs> I go, but they all hated me. She goes, good, good. And I'm thinking, all right, I drove home. And she sounds cool, man. 
Yeah. Well, she is cool. She died last year. She's. I know. I'm yeah, sorry. Condolence. More than room temperature. I remember my son. Uh, I went to a. Uh, I had a. Got invited to do somebody's fiftieth birthday party in a steakhouse, and they. Those gigs are always great. Right. And and private party. Nobody wants you there. Everyone's drunk. And uh, so they you're, asked you're me to the roast the one that the doesn't guy. know everyone there. It's a perfect setup for comedy. The guys, the guy at the time I was writing on the Comedy Central roasts and Triumph. So the, the guy said, oh, my God, will you roast my husband? And I said, sure. And Ray James, a, a great. Uh, I know, Ray. Yeah, we wrote and I, we brought my 10 year old son and I started roasting the birthday boy. And he hated it. Yeah. And there was obviously marital problems that the wife was using me for, but I wanted my money. So I just did the jokes I was paid for. And my son came home and he said, this was the greatest night of my life. Daddy ruined a man's 50th birthday party. It was great. It was great. I got this kid. I like this one. This one I like. <laughs> this kid gets it. Did Ray go on also? No, he watched. He got drunk watching me ruin a man's marriage as well. And you feel, do you feel any guilt with that? I think I'm dead inside. I, my yeah, son. Yeah, you are then. You are then. I, and I said yeah. to my son, not only, I said to him, Sonny boy, not only did I ruin this man's birthday, maybe his marriage, now I'm going to go collect <laughs> the check. <laughs> Watch your father. Walk. Did they pay you? Yeah. I walked across the room. I did. did what they I invite was, you back next year? No, oh. <laughs> I don't think. Was, no, it was. I always liked my kids seeing me bomb. I always felt it was important for them to just see me in in the worst possible setting doing comedy. And how did your kids react to you bombing? Uh, they, they they it's like it was like breathing to them. It, it was so natural to watch me bomb. But I wanted that. I didn't want to take them to like, like good comedy shows because I wanted them to see that. Have they ever seen you do well? Yes. <laughs> and it's awkward. It, it's it, the dynamic. It's it's uncomfortable for them to see me like they. Well, who is this guy? Like that's what? Weird. Yeah. Like, that's I, not the dad we know. Yeah. I, I like them seeing me. And then we, we don't see our father upsetting some other male. <laughs> We're not entertained and we don't feel like family. Interesting. So do you get haunted by a bad show? Like if you bomb, do you, does it upset you? No, no. Uh, well, first of all, it, it, I mean, it, not to sound like a whatever, but well, you it, don't it really, it really rarely, rarely, rarely right. happens. And, right. and no, I mean, I, I think if a comic doesn't do well one show or bombs or whatever right. the term you want to use, I, I, I think the best thing to do is, get on back on stage as soon as possible right and, right and have a good set and then it just the the the, the show but some people bomb a lot and i don't know how they i don't know why they don't just fucking quit you know what i mean it's like if 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 comedy was something where like you're bombing a lot it's like i i, I wouldn't do it <laughs> why would anyone want to do that i i think they have uh, like more than perfect hearing i think they hear laughs and nobody else can hear. Maybe they're just so narcissistic. I, I I don't know, but I mean I can't speak for them. But yeah, I've I, I've never understood comics who get nervous before shows, right? Uh, or who bomb a lot. I'm like, why are you fucking torturing yourself with this shit? Be a fucking reality star. Be a be a butt model on Instagram or something. <laughs> I mean, what are you what are you doing? You know? Yeah. It seems like more people. I don't know. Stand up is it's it's weird. It's sort of like this appreciated art form and at the same time, the most underappreciated art form. Y you know what I mean? Um, but uh, yeah, it's like cooking. Everybody, I think cooking is an art form. It is. Every but everybody can cook. I love to cook. Yeah, everybody can cook and everybody. Thinks. I think it's one of the most important skills for people to have. I think farming and cooking should be taught in every school. Yep, I agree with you. And eating. And, and eating. eating should be taught. Too. Eating that. Uh, and shitting. And eating shitting and shitting. Properly. Eating. And, and wiping. And wiping. I didn't wipe properly until I was 25. I wasn't educated. <laughs> who who taught you? 
I don't want to get into it. It's very painful. <laughs> See what I did with my kids, Judah, and this was wrong. But you know, how many kids you got? Sixteen. And sixteen I, kids. Sixteen kids. How many of them still talk to you? Uh, all of them. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Is so, that because they legally have to, or just because they want to? They're because they're all in my head. Okay, they're all cool. imaginary voices in my. I used, I told my kids, you write. You, this is how you save time. Wipe once a month. Okay, just you like know, wipe. I guess if you wipe really well, that's possible. Yeah, just wipe. It can be effective, and then then you're good for the you're good for the month. Okay, cool, man. Save yeah. paper, you know. Yeah. So twenty five. You weren't properly toilet trained. Do you realize how? No, no, no. Properly wiping trained. Wiping trained. Yeah. There's a difference, David. Yeah. They teach toilet training. They don't always teach wi proper wiping. Now, when you go into a public restroom, mm -hmm. do you make eye contact? Do you know if there's a no, man? No, I don't or, make fucking eye contact right. with people. I, do you know if it's a man or a woman or whatever, whoever is in the bathroom? Don't you just go do your business and leave? What does it matter who you're sharing the bathroom with? You know, I, I do a bit on that uh, with the whole... You know, the, the whole ridiculousness uh, of fighting over uh, bathrooms. And, and my whole thing is, like, I think we all grew up with um, bathrooms that every gender went to in our homes. You know, we didn't have segregated bathrooms in our homes. Yeah. You know, it wasn't until we went out into public that they segregated the bathrooms. Right. So... I, I, yeah, I think this obsession with bathrooms is more revealing about who these people are than I who, agree. Than who they're, they're, yeah, who I they're mean, I have a wide stance, so I agree. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, you're, you were a senator that was from Idaho. That bullshit right? uh, things, yeah. I went to that bathroom. It was in Minneapolis. It was the, Minneapolis, right? Yeah. At the airport. Yeah, and I'm telling you, you go in there, and it's like Plato's Retreat. There was something about that bathroom where you just wanted to kick back and meet an undercover cop. Larry Craig was his name, right? I don't remember. I, don't I remember. think it was Larry. Up oh, there it is. Yes. Larry Craig. Jenny's brother. Makes sense because I don't trust people with two first names. <laughs> Anyone who's like first name is a last name. Something's up. Larry Craig. Not trusted. Yeah. Yeah. That has to be the most humiliating thing. To be a United States senator, homophobic, Republican, and you get busted. Isn't that like 90% of them, though? That's like 90% <laughs> of them. I, I, you know what? I, I do think it is. I, I think you're being generous. Now, what do you think of Governor Ron DeSantis? What do you think of him? Do you I like him? I, I, I think he's got the blueprint. Yeah. He's He makes tough decisions. But you and I were talking. About I don't him. like him. I don't like him. I think he's too woke. He's too woke for me. I may agree with you. I think he's trying to get elected, but hopefully if he gets elected, then he'll really take on the woke culture. But to get elected, you can't show your your true self. But these woke people, they're the worst. It's interesting, like the whole terminology, like, like woke has taken off, like, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was PC. Mm -hmm. You know, that's always, you know, it's always like something different. Um, but, you know, similar kind of thing. I think it's an African-American. I think it's cultural appropriation. I think woke comes from. That's what I've been told. Yeah. So it is. Is it a dog? With, in all seriousness, uh, obviously, we hate Ron DeSantis. He's a fascist. Do you think? Woke I like him. I mean, he took those refugees from Central America um, who landed in Florida and right. the first thing he did was get them the fuck out of Florida. And, and <laughs> thing, I think I think that he should get a humanitarian award for that. <laughs> These people were sentenced to Florida and they got freed. <laughs> so I think people need to relook at Ron DeSantis. He's going to drop out. He's not even going to run. Right. It's going to be. I Trump. don't think anyone. I don't think there is any place that promotes Trump more than MSNBC. Right. And I'm completely serious. I think CNN, MSNBC, they promote Trump more than Fox News. And, and I'm I'm completely serious. I think I think the Democrats have decided Trump is the easiest candidate to, to defeat. Right. And they've given a directive to these news channels to nonstop talk about Trump. And if you notice with DeSantis, he's always 
I mean, I, I think the guy's a psychopath, obviously, but it's like, but you know, I think that they always portray him as somehow not doing well, you know, and they always portray Trump as like, it's inevitable. There's nothing, you know, and it's like, it's really disgusting, but I think those channels. Um, well, who do you fear more? Uh, in all seriousness, who do you fear more, DeSantis? I wouldn't use the word fear, but yeah. Who do you think is more dangerous, Trump or DeSantis? I think DeSantis is more dangerous. You can, sir, you can. I I see arguments for either one, and it, it's hard to say, but e- either one, you know, they're 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 different. They obviously have. You know, they, 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 they work in different ways, but... Um, See, the thing know. that made me... I'm fascinated by Trump. It, it, I, yeah, I should I'm not, but anyway. I am. I, I, I okay. find it... I, I, I don't You're know. You're watching I, too much MSNBC. I like really. to read the books about him. Uh, they're, they're, oh, okay. It's comfort food for me because he surrounds himself with weak uh, mental deficients who always end up screwing themselves over because that's how they end up in Trump's orbit. You cannot get into Trump's orbit unless you're a mental deficient, unless you're prone to violence. I know. I seriously, it's, it's, it's like, uh, I, I think it's something that's, that happens in a lot of areas where someone becomes a boss, you know, because they're related to someone or something like that. They're unqualified. And they don't want to be looking like an asshole at the company, so they hire. They also hire unqualified people. Exactly. And then the only people who are qualified are the lowest level employees who are making minimum wage, and they're fucking busting their asses to make up for all this other incompetency. Right. And they're the ones who get in trouble for anything. You know, you're. I, but think-, I, I think I think the news has been promoting Trump. I remember this when Trump was running against Clinton. Uh, what, 2016, I guess. They did a thing. It was, I remember it was Chris Matthews' show on MSNBC. The show was called 20 Years of Trump. And they showed 20 years of news clips of news journalists on TV asking Trump what he would do in certain situations if he was president, going back to the Iraq war, maybe even before. So there's your proof that the media had been promoting that fucking guy for 20 years before he became president. So I, I, I really think in many ways, you know, he's a he's a media that, that they've they're the ones who got him elected more than anyone. But but that's like blaming uh Radio. Why was he ever on a major news show on TV? Because well, That's like blaming. He was never a candidate. He was just a guy who said he was rich. That's it. It's like blaming the the uh, radio shows for playing Pavarotti. Can you blame somebody for wanting to listen to Pavarotti? So it, Trump is like Pavarotti. I wouldn't use that analogy. That's offensive to Italy. Not fair. There- I remember in the early, well, mid-90s, I'm having soccer practice. I'm in a, in a you know a men's league. This is in the Lower East Side in East River Park. We're practicing, and this is a big open. Well, it's like a narrow, long open field. It's not big, but uh, you know it, it's probably like the area we're in is a few blocks long. You know, there's baseball field, open field. We're having soccer practice. It's a very international team. A lot of British, a lot of South American, Middle East. Eastern Europe, a few American. Uh, so anyways, we're having a soccer practice. And all of a sudden, and we practice there like twice a week. And then all of a sudden, two cops walk up to us and they tell us we got to move back because we're too close to the softball field. Now, we always practice there. No cops ever tell us to fucking move. And there's plenty of fucking space. Who's having a softball game? Trump is having an office softball game. Mm. So his organization is playing some other one. And this is when he was with Marla Maples. Mm. And I remember she actually looked like she was good. You know, she was like catching balls. She was throwing some people out. Trump sucked. Really? He sucked, dude. He did. a. I remember he pot. He, he was up at the plate. 
I don't even think he fielded. it. He didn't even field. He would just like go in and hit. And uh, so he didn't even put on a fucking glove. Wow. And then he gets up at the bat and it's like a little pop-up ball that doesn't even get to the pitcher's mound. And then, you know, they catch it and he does like a little, a little sort of like laughing jog to first, you know, and doesn't get all the way there. Yeah. So Marla yeah. Maples, good at softball. Trump, bad athlete. And I don't think we can have a bad athlete for president. So. No, no, you're right. You never see him. Did he ever throw the the the, the ball out? Uh, I don't think he ever did that. No. Yeah. Yeah. There are certain people like Trump, who there. I think most most men I know. I can't speak for women, but most guys I know had to readjust. They had to think, okay, I'm, this isn't working for me. I need to rebuild parts of my psyche. You know, you, you leave your parents, you go off into the world, you get shit on, you realize, you know what? It's probably me. It's a cruel world out there, but still, I need to readjust. I don't think Trump ever had a moment where he thought, I need to change direction here. I think he had setbacks, but it would always be somebody else's fault. It would be unfair and unjust, but I don't think he had, I think he had childhood trauma that's unresolved, but I don't think he ever got punched in the face, which seems to... Yeah, I don't know. Could be. I don't, I don't, there are a couple I don't of people. I know this is a horrible thing. I don't thing. think about them much. Did you ever get punched yeah. in the face? What's that? Did anybody ever punch you in the face? And uh, is it wrong to say some people would benefit from a, a punch in the face? David, these are things you have to talk between you and your rabbi. <laughs> My rabbi is the one who punched me. Do you know that Rabbi Geltzaler... I don't know who that is. I, I went to my mom's Catholic, so I'm I'm, I'm not religious. So okay, I'm, uh, I went Catholic. to Orthodox Hebrew school, and Rabbi Geltzaler. You went to Orthodox Hebrew school. Yes, yes, wow. I did. And Rabbi Geltzaler used to punch me in the stomach hard, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, "I'm telling my father." How old were you? I don't know, thirteen, twelve. Jeez, that's terrible. I'm sorry, dude. That's and I awful. I'd go. I'm telling my parents. He'd go, "Good." I went home and I said, Rabbi Gelsaler punched me in the stomach. And my parents went, good. <laughs> that sounds See, today that would be, <laughs> that would probably be a lawsuit today. It's like, uh -huh. I think things like that went on a lot more back then. Or people got away with them a lot more back then. That's how I might, like, I, I went to pump gas my senior year in high school. I was pumping gas and my father would pull in and he would go speak to the owner and and he'd say every time he'd go to the owner, it was the guy's name was Andy Stilatos, and he, my father would say, "I want you to treat my son like he's family." In other words, rough him up, <laughs> don't take it. I want him coming. This home. is when you were working there. Or? Yeah, yeah. My father used to say, "Treat him like he's like your son. Just don't give him an inch." Different times. Uh, different times. That was yeah. in Jersey, right? I uh, uh, 9W. I, I pump gas at the Rustic Cabin Exxon where Frank Sinatra. It was uh, Frank Sinatra's. Is 9W the exit? 9W is the road. Oh, yeah, right. I know that road. That, that's yeah. parallel to the to 95, I right. think. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a north-south road. Yeah, and if you stay on 9W and go north, you can get polio. It, it takes you up to Rockland County where polio is. Uh, well, it's making a comeback there. It's making a comeback. And you grew up in Maryland? Mostly Maryland, yeah. And and your parents, you're, you're from a mixed marriage. What do you mean? Well, your mom was a, a woman. My mom's Catholic. Oh, okay. And and you're fine. So was that Jewish. scandalous? My Jewish. My mom's Catholic. Which side was it more scandalous for? Uh, both, probably. Yeah. You know. I know it was I, I, I you know, I, I don't I don't know the correct answer on that, but I, I know it was. Uh, do you have a do you do you, do you <laughs> I have, know it was not? Easy. Are you an atheist? Do you believe in a higher power? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Maybe you seem yeah. kind of spiritual. I'm spirit. I would say I'm spiritual. Yeah. And did you find spirituality through stand up comedy? Because that's where I found it. 
where, where you, like I found, oh, this is what the universe is like. You connect with everybody, but I get to be the center of attention. <laughs> oh, I, I don't think I ever considered looking at anything that way. We have a question from Tim. What's a good open mic in New York for radical leftists? That I don't know. Um, I, I have a question back for Tim, though. Yeah. Does he do stand up comedy? Has he done open mics before? I, I think he has. He probably I think he was last time he uh, I spoke to him, he was trying his. Um, tell him yeah, I don't I know, do. but if he finds out to let me know. Oh, here he is. I unmuted myself. Oh, there you go, Tim. Got the power. Yeah, I did uh, open mics in Beijing, the Pyongyang of comedy. I know they have a comedy scene there. Um, they do. Joe and they have Wong's a comedy there. in English scene there as well. Um, That's right. Are they English speaking comedy clubs or are they speaking Chinese? There's both. Yeah. But they, I don't I don't know if Beijing has a full time English language comedy club. But I think at least no. before the pandemic, they had a lot of English language comedy nights at different venues. Yeah, yeah, it's not that established. You know, the, the, the overseas, Chinese language one is. Overseas, many, uh, you know, stand-up comedy is newer in, in many countries than in America. So the the scenes are, are comic-run, you know, and they're comic-created, which is actually good, mm -hmm. I think. Um, oh, you're right. To, yeah, it is. As opposed oh. to being in the U.S., where if you're starting comedy, you have to go, you have to start in a place where there's already a structure. There's, there's positives to that too, but there's also negatives. It's actually, you know, very kind of interesting. If, you, if there's no comedy scene and you can actually create a scene, you know, that that's really pretty cool. If you think right. about it. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tim is good is luck, Tim. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know of one, but uh, if there is one, that would be cool. But I, I'm not aware of one, but I'm also completely out of the loop. So I don't right. know. Radical leftists. I think of Randy Credico, uh, Barry Crimmins, comedians who were just. I remember doing a show with them at a place called Commons, I think, in Brooklyn on Atlantic mm -hmm. Avenue. I think it's like a communist uh, coffee shop lounge kind of place. Do you think it's harder to be a radical leftist comedian? I do, because I think in order to be really funny, you're going to disagree with me on this. So this will be interesting. I, I think if you're going to do politics, you got to do ad hominem attacks. You got to hit below the belt. You got to really hurt them. That's what I feel that you have to attack them. Uh, make them cry in like a lowbrow way. You mean no highbrow, but I don't think you. I think you take the gloves off with somebody like Trump uh, or George W. Bush. If if you're on the left, it's your responsibility to comedically destroy the other team and and just go for it. And I don't think leftist audiences are malicious enough to appreciate that. Mm, yeah, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I, I think I think centrist audiences might be... It's hard to know on that. Um, that's an interesting point. I, I just don't know the answer to it. I just... I... I do, you I think do, but I do. I, I, I don't let the audience dictate what I'm going to do. Um, so... Uh, do, you, do you think right-wing audiences are easier... That seems to be the consensus that, uh, you know, it, it, that's a great question. And I really think all political angles, you know, people of all political perspective, you know, right wing, far right wing, um, Democrat voting, uh, and then people who are actually left. Um, I, I think they all have their sensitive spots where they say, oh, you've crossed the line. I think they all do. You know, I, I think there are certain factions that are, they, they think they, they, they're actually looking for things to be offensive. Um, they won't see any of their own stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but they're, they're looking for someone to say the wrong word. Uh, they're, they're, they're looking to take someone down. Uh, I, I think you'll find more of that on the, for lack of a better term, the left, you right. know, or even the, 
Democrat. You know, I right. wouldn't necessarily call Democrats left. I mean, I think some are, but I think most maybe think they are, but they're really not. Right. But right. You know. Are you done with Twitter or do you use Twitter? I, you know, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, but I literally the past couple months, I'm probably posting maybe once a week. You know, I'm just kind of, you know, I, I, I'm worn out from those things and I'm trying not to to be on them because I there there's great things about them and there's really bad things about them. So right. I'm, I'm like not very active on any of them right now. Right. Uh, but no, I haven't like left Twitter or anything like that. It seems like just in the past couple of weeks, more and more doing that. But um, I think there's still a lot of good information on there. So, I mean, I'm, I, I never would have been on any social media if it wasn't for, um, just trying to make a living and promote shows that I do. That's the reason when, why I went on any social media. And then, you know, I started after being on it, realizing that for some of it, it's, um, you know, you can actually get, you can, you can get a lot of bad information, obviously, but you can get a lot of good information that you won't see on the news or even necessarily the newspaper. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What is your reading like, like, how do you stay abreast of things? Well, it's not just reading. It's just kind of getting out there, too, you know, talking to people, being around uh, all different uh, people from all different walks of life and, um, you know, engaging. I, I think so many people don't engage anymore. They're just on their phones and they don't they don't engage with anyone. They don't connect with anyone. Uh, and then as far as like news and stuff goes, it's, it's really a, a big variety of of stuff um from mainstream to to left wing uh i'll even check out some of the right wing or far right wing stuff because i want to know what they're saying and sometimes they'll have valid criticism of democratic party that you won't hear on <laughs> you know democratic channels that you probably should be hearing about i mean right. they're doing it for just for you know political purposes not really for justice purposes i don't think and then you know enter some international sites um you know some of the you know left-wing independent uh you know blogs or whatever they're called yeah you know, well does getting it out there going to protests you right know, just, are you more political now than you were when you first started doing comedy I no, think it's interesting. You, you know when i first started i did a lot of political stuff but it you know i was i mean i was 19 when i started but, you know, and you were going to NYU back then. You, you were at N you were at NYU with John Fugel saying I was I never mentioned that I went to NYU because I I I went to films. You know, when I was 16, I started writing jokes and I knew I wanted to do stand up comedy. And when I was a kid earlier, I would make my own animated movies, clay animation and drawing animation. And then, you know, I started, you know, writing uh, some movies also. So I knew I wanted to make movies. Uh, but when when I realized it was six, when I was 16, I, that's when I realized that stand up comedy was something you can do. I didn't know that it was like uh, a career. Where was the first place she played? Uh, Garvin's Comedy Club in Washington, D.C. I, I play, uh, Harry Monacuso. That was the owner, I think? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that and, name sounds familiar. And he was good friends. I didn't deal with him because I was just doing an open mic. Right. So, Harry Monica. Harry, that was in 1989. Yeah. He already stopped booking me by then. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Garvin's. Hilarious. Was it a hotel? Because it kind of moved around. No, Garvin's was always at different locations. Right. Um, and it was... Uh, no, it was their own comedy venue, and it was a really cool little room. Yeah. They had the stage in the corner, and uh, so it was well set up, and then the audience kind of going out in like a triangle semicircle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, a, it was a good setup. Yeah. I remember he was but Yeah, good that was the first place I went on stage. Yeah. He was good friends with Mark Russell, who passed away. Oh, wow. And Mark Russell was interesting because he built his own comedy. He did musical comedy, right? Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and, and did, political comedy. Yeah. And he did his own scene. Like he didn't play the clubs. He would go into a hotel. This was always my fantasy when I was much younger to go into a hotel and say, let me have this room every night from like eight to 11. And you create your own audience as right. opposed to right. going into 
your generic comedy club where they want a Big Mac served the same way every show. Right, 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 right. The, 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 although I do think comedy audiences are a little more sophisticated than they were during they the... They are, they are, because, you know, back in like the 80s, it was literally like uh, comedy night, you mm -hmm. know? It's comedy. They don't say what kind of comedy. That would like that would be similar to being like, "Hey guys, it's music night." Right. And they don't tell anyone what genre of music. So so there's definitely like different genres of comedy for lack of a better term. Yeah. And the audiences usually often know what they're getting into. Yeah. New York City and LA where they have the so-called showcase clubs where it's not one particular headliner someone's going to see. It's like a, a mystery lineup, for lack of a better term. Those places, you're more likely getting people who are just like, oh, we like comedy, but they have no idea what they're about to see. Um, did, now, who who did you see live that it was just, you went, oh, this is the sexiest thing in the world to be a stand-up comic? Who did you see where you thought, oh, my God, this is... Well, you know, what, what What first turned me on was, and this is when I first realized you can do stand-up comedy, there was a show that came on in the early to mid-80s, like 1985 is the first time I saw it. It was called Comedy Tonight, and Bill Boggs was the oh, host. right, yeah. And, and you know, so it, it was a half-hour show that had like four or five comics on it. It came on at like 2.30 in the morning. I wasn't allowed to stay up that late, but we just got a, VA, a VCR mm -hmm. and I figured out how to program it so I can program the show. Right. And then it was um, so they have all these comics. And then because before, you know, I'd see Rodney Dangerfield, you know, you know, stuff like that, you know, and I'd be like, oh, this is great. But, you know, th that seemed like it, it there wasn't like a connection was that like that you that was something you could do. It was just like something you saw on TV. But on this show. They would have the comic go on and then they would uh, they would say, hey, where are you playing this weekend? And then they would say, oh, I'm at this comedy club. And I'm like, wait a second. I didn't know there were comedy clubs. Right. You know, I'm like, oh, there's a place where comics perform and you can go watch them and, and comics can work. I'm like, oh, this is like a job. This is something you can do. That was so. Right. So that was when I was like, oh, you can do this. I'm like, I want to do that. So that's yeah. when I started writing jokes. And then when, when I was 19, I started doing it. Wow. Hey, we have to wrap it up. This was great. This was yeah. really great. Yeah. Uh, Judah Friedlander does live stand up on. You do, you do it on Zoom now, right? You do yeah, it it's on, I've been doing it on Zoom, you know, since like June 2020. I do my own shows. I don't know if I'm having one this week because I just got back to the city, but I usually do about a, a two hour show. It's it's an, it's on Zoom. It's in a meeting setup so that the audience can interact. Right. Unlike your elitist setup here tonight where well, you have the my you have audience the kings and then you have the peons who can't interact with well, you. you. I'll yeah. introduce you to Davey Mammal and you'll and see. Then, uh, and yeah, so it's about it's interactive. It's I do about a, a 90 minute to two hour set. Uh, it's pay what you want. And uh, I announce it on my website or on my Twitter. So I might have one this weekend. If not, I'll definitely have one next week. It's great. Let's do this more often. Thank you. Uh, okay. Judah yeah, Friedlander. We'll re return my emails. Then I, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> JudahFriedlander.com. JudahFriedlander.com. Yeah. You're listening to The David Feldman Show. You happy, self-actualized hump. <laughs>